Well, I salute each and every one with the honorable and the blessing words of grace, mercy, and peace. May they be multiplied unto you. We welcome you to T.L. Elliott Ministries. For those who may not know me, I am Archbishop or Dr. T.L. Elliott. Uh, I am the instructor and host for tonight's Bible study. And in tonight's Bible study, we continue on a very profound journey that I believe when it comes to any of the writings of the word of the Lord that we have in the canonized Bible. And tonight we continue on the subject of one of the Old Testament prophets. Uh, some would say a profound or prolific prophet, uh, but the prophet that I'm referring to is Micah, or as some would uh, possibly enunciate his name, Micah or Micahu which, you know, from the translation that we can understand out of the Hebraic language, it means who is like Yahweh or who can be compared uh, to the almighty God. This is what is the enunciation, not only in the meaning of the name, but understand even under Hebraic culture, names are associated with characteristics or associated with one's reputation. So we're believing not only is this an individual who is identified in the name of Micah or Makkah, but it is an individual who bears the character of one who challenges those uh, to say who can compare to the Lord God that I represent as his messenger, who can be like out of all beings, uh, even Elohim or the spiritual realm, who can be compared to the most high God? So in that, this begins to, you know, shape, I believe, not only for me, but hopefully for those who are readers of the book of Micah and Micah, it begins to shape your mindset even as you read what is declared by the prophet in the writing to enunciate the significance of the power of the word that they're delivering. Amen. So in saying that, uh, tonight we began on a new journey in the book of Micah. And I say new journey to really imply we pick up with a new chapter in the book of Micah. And the chapter that I'm referring to is chapter six, amen. Chapter six of the book of Micah. Um, and this chapter, what we're going to come to discover is this chapter centers itself on the Lord God's uh, controversy with Israel. If I could kind of give you a brief overview of the chapter, we come to discover that the chapter really has about three significant areas or points that it addresses, amen? So if I was breaking down the chapter, then verses uh, uh, one, uh, uh, we, one and two, excuse me, we find centers around the Lord's past and present controversy with Israel, as I just articulated for the chapter. But then as we begin to transition into verses three through eight, we will see the Lord's specified controversy with the people, which is basically going to be about sin and judgment. And then when we get to verse nine through 16, uh, we began to see the Lord's controversy or conflict with the city itself. Amen. So these are three key areas of this chapter. And tonight I'm going to try to attempt to get from verse one to verse eight to cover the first two. If the Lord permits us to get that far, if not amen, because as always, we come to discover that there is so much rich meat within the text, especially when we look at the text beyond the natural interpretation. And I emphasize that because for those who have been with me on any previous teachings or those who may be picking up and, and dropping in to hear this now, uh, I always want to emphasize more than the literal translation that we understand, but take you beyond and stretch you to the spiritual or the metaphorical interpretation as well. Because understand this, the, the one, one of the most key things as to why that should be significant is because as believers, 
I believe it's what keeps us in balance in our interpretation of scripture. It's good to have the literal understanding, but it's also great to have the spiritual understanding, especially when the word is intended for your spiritual man to operate your natural man, not your natural man operating your spiritual man. So if if I can feed, i.e. my spirit man, by the spiritual understanding of the scripture, now it will personify my natural understanding. And in the same turn, we will be more or more readily equipped for our eternal existence with the Lord in a spiritual place or in the realm of Elohim, El realm of the spirit, the realm of the Lord God and of Christ and of the Holy Spirit that goes beyond what our natural mind can comprehend in this dispensation or in this time period. Amen. So, so in that, bear with me as I continue to hopefully give some continued deeper revelation regarding the scriptures so that hopefully it feeds you and carries you a little bit further than how you've originally looked at the scripture or what lens you've been discerning it through. Amen. So as I say that, uh, let us begin to get into the text, amen, and see how far we'll be able to get on tonight. So here in Micah chapter six, we begin with the very first verse, and it's almost as if the Lord is making a plea to the people. Amen. And the scripture says thus, it says, hear ye now what the Lord saith. Arise, contend thou before the mountains, and let the hills hear thy voice. All right. Now, understand this. Let me kind of give you a segue because since we're jumping in into chapter six, I remind you what we were able to extrapolate from chapter five. As we note, the prophet is prophesying to a people about their pride and their arrogance that brings the judgment of the Lord on their life. But what we continue to see even from chapter one all the way up to chapter six is the Lord has a divine plan as he speaks through the mouth of the prophet Micah. And as he speaks through Micah, I also remind you something that's very profound from chapter one to the conclusion of the book. We find that Micah is often talking in first person, meaning as if he is literally possessed by the Lord God, being the Lord God in the earth operating in the flesh of this individual to decree words to people to hear. Uh, so, so in that we we're, we're finding that Micah is still speaking to the people regarding what their faults are, what are the corrections that are needed for eternal living and what is going to be the price to get there. When we dissected chapter five in the previous teachings, we, we looked at one, the redemptive work of Christ that was being prophesied by Micah thousands of years before Jesus comes on the scene. We also see that Israel is given up until she repents, meaning Israel as a people is given over to their unrighteousness until they're in a place of repentance to be restored. And then the third piece of chapter five, we see the restoration of Israel based upon not only the coming Messiah that they were, that the prophet was, was speaking of 500 years before time, but also uh, the, the, the Messiah coming again in the future dispensation. What we saw was a blending of what was to come when Jesus came to the earth, did his ministry for three and a half years, died on the cross and resurrected, but yet the prophet also spoke future tense as to when the, the second advent is, at the second time when he comes to redeem uh, his remnant for eternal living. Uh, so, so in that, when we have that mindset, now we can kind of look at chapter six and see where the prophet is taking us as he's speaking under the unction of the Holy Spirit or the character of the Lord unto the people. So now let us read that verse again. He said, the Lord God is speaking through the prophet and says, hear ye now what the Lord saith. Now the prophet speaks first person 
again, arise, contend thou before the mountains and let the hills hear thy voice. What is the prophet saying here? First of all, the prophet in the enunciation of the verse itself, he makes a profound word to them. He says, hear ye now what the Lord saith. And in saying this, the prophet is not just saying, let some audible noise go through your eardrums. When we say hear, the Hebrew word that's used is Shema. And Shema means to listen with the intent to take action. Listen again. It means to listen or hear with an intent to take action based on what you heard. So the prophet speaks and says, I'm about to tell you something that the Lord said, but it's something not just to tickle your ears to be just good music or good remedy that comes in through your ears that you say, hmm, that sounded very nice. This is something that I'm going to say that has instructions with it that you need to follow because it's going to be indicative upon uh, where your life is headed in relationship with the Lord. So in that, now the prophet says, arise, meaning to be established. It's not just getting up out of a chair or getting up out of a bed. The prophet is saying, it's time for you to be established. It's time for you to do a continued work or pick up and start a work that you have to continue. So in this, he says, arise, contend thou before the mountains. And when the prophet says to contend, he says, I need you to be in a debate. I need you to be defensive against the mountains. Now, some may be listening to me right now and saying, well, why would the prophet speak on the Lord's behalf and tell them to begin to start a debate or an argument with inanimate objects such as mountains? Well, here's the thing that you have to understand based upon the culture at hand that the prophet is speaking to. Understand, mountains were considered to be high places, excuse me, high places, all right? Now, they were identified as high places because they were considered to be the place where you made connection with the spiritual realm on a higher degree than being in the low place or in the valley. In the same turn, you will come to discover that the mountains were also the symbolic place as to where you would find temples being built. Amen. And understand, if anybody does any historical research on many of the ancient temples of the other cultures, whether we talk about the Egyptians, whether we talk about the Babylonians, whether we we uh, uh, talk about uh, the Aztecs, notice that they use pyramids or ziggurats. And when you do any research on their uh, process of faith practice, temples in those manners were not meant uh, to get you up to God. Temples were meant to bring God to you. Let, let me say that again. Temples were not symbolic per se, to getting you to a place to get up to God, the temples were meant to bring God to you. Almost as if it was saying that the Lord God has to yield, or not the Lord God, let me rephrase that. Any deity that they were worshiping, they were saying, in order for me to deal with you, you gotta come down to my turf and be on my level to deal with me. That was the concept based on many of the ancient pagan cultures of worshiping deities, i.e., as we would say, lower level Elohim, or lower level spiritual beings that were persistent at being territorial and being gods to people, but not being the most high God, not being the Lord God, not being the God of hosts or God of the spiritual realm. 
So in this, now you can begin to understand what the prophet is declaring on behalf of the Lord by saying, I want you to cause an argument or a debate or challenge the mountains because the mountains are the high places of worship. And as high places of worship, these were the worship centers of once again, pagan deities. So now you can understand why he's saying, I need you to make a debate. Instead of you compromising and submitting yourself to false God worship or pagan worship or lower Elohim worship, he says, I need you to have an issue with it. Listen to what I'm saying. He's saying, I need you to make this an issue for you. It's not only an issue for me as the one su supreme God, it should be an issue for you. So now you need to be using your authority or the power in your voice to make argument with what you have exalted in high places of worship. So the scripture says, arise, contend thou before the mountains and let the hills Giba, which means illicit place of worship, i.e. Uh, paganistic worship places that are what causes you to form spiritual adultery against the Lord, i.e. you're supposed to be in relationship with the Lord God, but you're tipping through the tulips and still having relationship with false gods, which is a form of spiritual adultery, which makes these temples become illicit because you have a temple that's for uh, uh, the true and living God, but yet you're going to foreign temples and worshiping other gods. So he says, I need you to let the hills hear thy voice. Hear not only what you're saying, but also hear the frequency that you're on, the sound that you're making. You should actually be the shafar for the Lord that brings warning even to the pagan gods or the false gods or the other spiritual entities that exist. Somebody I hope is listening to this because this is probably stretching you and giving you a little bit more spiritual revelation as to the depth of what the prophet is saying here. Now, in this, there's, there's a little bit more background to this uh, because as, as I was looking at this with the challenge to the mountains, this is not the first and the only time that this has been acknowledged in scripture. What I come to discover is the prophet Ezekiel enunciates the same thing. Now, keep this in mind for those who may not know, I guess, time periods. Micah is a prophet who is during the 8th century. And as I say during the 8th century, he's a contemporary, or should I say a fellow prophet, to Isaiah, Hosea, and Amos, or Amos, because all of them are in this 700 time frame of BCE, before the Common Era. So, uh, Micah is in the 700 BC era as well. So you've got four prophets that are on the scene that are speaking something. But what I bring to your attention is that even Ezekiel enunciates this a little bit later. Now, the reason I say that Ezekiel enunciates it a little bit later, because I know somebody that's listening to me saying, but, but wait a minute, doesn't uh, his book come before Micah? Yes, it does. However, keep this in mind. Ezekiel lived between 593 and 570 BCE. All right. So that means he came after the time period per se of, of Micah, but yet don't let me get anybody confused there is sequential order of things that's being prophesied or, or uh, displayed in history that the books are associating with as we find them in the Old Testament. Just like if I can say as a sidebar, technically Job's book is the oldest book of the Bible. 
Job is older than Moses' first five books, the Torah or, or the Pentateuch. However, due to the fact that Moses' writings predate the life story that Job is recording, that is why it is canonized prior to the book of Job. Amen. So, so I don't want you to get thrown off just because I'm giving you some historical data and some time frame, but I, I'm wanting you to also be able to process what's being said, when it's being said, and why it's being said. Because now, as I mentioned Ezekiel, you can get a little bit more depth as to why the Lord is saying, speak against the mountains. All right. If we may, let us quickly go to the book of Ezekiel, and I'm going to show you a couple of scriptures that associates with what Micah is declaring here in this first verse. If we go to Ezekiel chapter 6, in Ezekiel chapter 6, verses 2 and 3, the scripture says, Son of man, set thy face towards the mountains of Israel. And prophesy against them and say, ye mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord God. Thus saith the Lord God to the mountains and to the hills, to the rivers and to the valleys. Behold, I, even I will bring a sword upon you and I will destroy your high places. And your altars shall be destroyed and your images shall be broken. And I will cast down your slain men before your idols. All right. So, so in this, Ezekiel brings out one of the reasons that they're speaking against these high places or these pagan temples is because of the practice of idolatry. What we find is, uh, uh, altars and images being made that they are yielding to. So this gives us a glimpse of a little bit of what Micah is implying with speaking against the mountains. If we still stay there in Ezekiel, turn with me quickly to chapter 35. And in chapter 35, looking at verse 11 and 12, we find the same language being spoken again. It says, therefore, as I live, saith the Lord God, I will even do according to thine anger and according to thy envy, which thou has used out of thy hatred against them. And I will make myself known among them when I have judged thee. And thou shalt know that I am the Lord and that I have heard all thy blasphemies which thou hast spoken against the mountains of Israel, saying they are laid desolate, they are given us to consume. Same language. Go to the next chapter of Ezekiel. If we looked at uh, chapter 36, verses 1 through 8, we'll find the same language. It says, also thou son of man, Prophesy unto the mountains of Israel. Prophesy to the mountains of Israel and say, Ye mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, because the enemy hath said against you, Ah, even the ancient high places are ours in possession. Therefore, prophesy and say, Thus saith the Lord God because they have made you desolate and swallowed you up on every side that ye might be a possession unto the residue of the heathen. And ye are taken up in the lips of talkers and are an infamy of the people. Therefore, ye mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord God. Thus saith the Lord God to the mountains and to the hills, to the rivers and to the valleys, to the desolate wastes and to the cities that are forsaken, which became a prey and derision to the residue of the heathen that are round about. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, surely in the fire of my jealousy have I spoken against thee, residue of the heathen and against all Idumea, 
which have appointed my land into their possession with the joy of all their heart, with despiteful minds to cast it out for prey. Notice now, it says prophesy, therefore concerning the land of Israel and say unto the mountains and to the hills, to the rivers and to the valleys, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I have spoken in my jealousy and in my fury because you have borne the shame of heathen. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, I have lifted up my hand. Surely the heathen that are about you, they shall bear their name. But ye, O mountain of Israel, you shall shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit to my people of Israel, for they are at hand to come. Notice once again the language what the prophet even Ezekiel spoke in these passages regarding speaking against the mountain, because technically the mountain has caused issues with the Lord. The mountain has caused denial of the people of the blessings of the things of the Lord God. It's the mountains that causes you to be in uh, your own bondages or in your own incarcerations. Uh, so, so in that, we began to get a real picture, not only of what's going on with the children of Israel at the time of Micah. If I can pause for a moment I could actually revert this to us even in the now. How many have found themselves uh, compromising their relationship with the Lord God because you're still going to the mountain in a matter of speaking and worshiping pagan deities or doing paganistic practices that the Lord is edging you and trying to prime you to say, in order to release yourself from that, you first got to have a problem with it. Until we have a problem, hopefully this is prophesying to somebody that's listening to me right now. Until you got a problem with what pagan practices you are doing, those things are still keeping you and hindering you from being in a place with the Lord God. The judgment has to come upon you. So it takes you to be like the children of Israel here and begin uh, to contend, begin to debate, begin to defend yourself against those paganistic practices. So now with that being said, let us begin to look at verse two. It says, hear ye, O mountain. Now notice the prophet Micah is still in the same vein as what we hear in the writings of Ezekiel. He says, hear ye, O mountains, the Lord's controversy. I need you as a mountain to hear what the Lord's complaint is. I need you, O mountains or high places or pagan temples of worship to hear the dispute or the quarrel or the war that's going on within the Lord regarding what you represent and what you're doing. He says, hear ye, O mountains, the Lord's controversy. And ye strong foundations of the earth, for the Lord hath a controversy with his people, and he will plead with Israel. So, let us ask ourselves, what is the prophet really telling us here in verse 2? Well, as I mentioned here a few moments ago, he brings back to our attention kind of the same language as Ezekiel by, by telling them the mountain that the Lord has an issue with you. The Lord has a complaint with you and what you represent, especially all of you strong or constant or permanent foundations or establishments of the earth. So, so in this, what, what the Lord brings out through the prophet it's not only are there high places of worship, what has happened, these high places of worship are also duplicated in the land in other establishments. Now, that probably gives some of us an aha moment, especially as I gave the prophetic revelation to us in the now from verse one, 
what is around you that is still resembling uh, these high places? What around you has become the establishments that represent the pagan temples? What around you has established itself to represent the worship of all of these uh, uh, false gods or lower level spiritual beings? See, this is not just something that speaks to the people in the time of the scriptures, we believe that the record is written not only to tell us what are the good, bad, ugly, and indifferent things of our forefathers, but the record is written so that what their faults are, we can recognize them or have a record so we don't fall in the same cycle. This is the intent as to why even right now we're having this Bible study teaching to say, wait a minute, begin to turn on spiritual eyes and see this for what it is. We can recognize what it is in the natural, but some people will probably deny it because you're saying, well, we don't have no mountains and, and no temples that we go worship at other than the churches that we worship uh, the Lord God. But it begs to differ because some of the world systems are also uh, representative of this. If not, when Paul says the God of this world has blinded the minds, he's seared us because we're right now in partial sight. We're in a place of seeing in darkness that may not mean that all light is absent, but it does mean what you do see is obscured. It's, it's a little bit uh, difficult for you to make a distinction. It's blurred in, in layman's terms. So, so in that, the prophet speaks out under the spirit of the Lord. It's the spirit of the Lord that tells you to look at things and begin to recognize it for what it is and discern what is truly not clear as to being the Lord God. So in that, the prophet says, there's a controversy with the foundations of the earth. It says, for the Lord hath controversy or has a complaint or a quarrel with his people. See, because in this, watch this. Technically, the text says, based on the places and the things that represent paganism, this is what is the catalyst that causes the, that the Lord God to have problems with his people or Y-O-U. This is what he's looking at. So in looking at this, the Lord God challenges you by making a plea with you. Micah declares this to the children of Israel. He says, he says based on what the Lord God sees and has me checking what he has me calling out, he says, now I make a plea with you. And, 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 and what is a plea? See, a plea isn't just to beg somebody. In our Western world culture, we look at pleading with somebody as us just begging them to either do something or not to do something. But when we look at that word plead that's here out of the Hebrew, it's yakash. And yakash means to correct or to reprove, to justify or to convict. So when the Lord pleads with you, it's not just him asking you and begging you to do something. Some of his pleading is demonstrated based on what he allows to happen to you or based on what he decides to do to you. I hope somebody understands. So, so he's pleading with you. Some of the things right now, somebody probably is having a V8 moment. Like, oh, wow, now I understand why the Lord let that happen to me. Or now I understand why the Lord is convicting me about something that I'm doing. It's part of his plea to you in order to get you in the right place. And this is what the prophet was saying to the people then. And it's still what the Lord God is speaking in the now. So now it brings us to verse three, it brings us to verse three. 
in verse three of the text. It says, O oh my people, what have I done unto thee? Now, the prophet is still speaking in first person. He's speaking as if he is the Lord God. He says, O oh my people, what have I done unto thee? And wherein have I wearied thee? Testify against me. So three things are happening. There's two questions and, and one response. Two questions, one response. He says, first of all, my people, which he's identifying as his flock, his sheep. He says, my, my, my flock or my sheep, what have I done unto thee? Now, this is a bold question because, see, this question can actually go two, two ways. And the reason I say that this question can go two ways is when we look at the word done here in the text, it's awa, A-W-A-H, all right? However, when you understand the term awa, it is not limited to what we say in Western world. Because if I said, I'm going to do something to you, and you say, look at what you did or look at what you have done, we take that into negative context meaning that it's something that has taken oh, uh, taken something away from you or caused something to be flawed or has caused something to be unusable. However, the term awa that's used here means applied or to apply to or to add to. So in this, now let us look at what the real question is. He says, oh, my people or my flock, what have I added or applied to you? Now, that's a bold question because in that, as the prophet enunciates that, if it's God doing a work, if it's the Lord God who's doing the work that has you in the position that you're in, and I hope I'm prophesying to somebody right now as well, the question becomes not what he took away from you or not what he caused to make uh, appear to be bad or difficult. It, it should be what has he applied to you in the process. So in this, that's the first question. Because the Lord God has said, I'm dealing with my sheep. I'm dealing with my people. And when I deal with my people, I'm adding to my people. I'm multiplying my people. I'm not a Lord God that's bringing division and subtraction to them. So anything that I'm doing in their life, I'm, I'm doing something that's adding to them. Even when you get stretched in bad situations, it's not that the bad situation is supposed to make you worse. The bad situation help add to you to make you better. In, in uh, 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 Romans 8, 28, the scripture says all things, meaning all words, work together for the good of the Lord. Those called according to his purpose, Brrr, meaning all things, everything that's said and every action that's done works together for the benefit of the Lord based on those who have been called or invited to his purpose or his destiny. So if that be the case, now we can see a New Testament scripture now come alive right here in an Old Testament text. He says, what have I done to thee? What have I added to you? What, what have I done in the goodness to you? In conjunction with that, we have a section question. He says, wherein have I wearied you? Or wherein have I wearied thee? And uh, even with the word wherein, it's really implying how have I uh, grieved you? How have I put a load on you? How have I put you in a place that you have become emotionally disgusted based on the load that apparently I placed on your life in your interpretation, but I've looked at it as an application or something being applied or added to you. Let that, let that sink in for a minute. Ah, oh, wow. 
This is what this is what the Lord God is dealing with us in the now. And it's the same thing that he was dealing with the children of Israel when he was speaking through the mouth of the prophet. So then he presents these two questions to his people. And it's really a question that only they can answer. That's why it's directed to his people. It's not, it's not directed to the world. It's, it's not directed to the ungodly. He says to my sheep. This is a you and I discussion. So that means this is a spiritual discussion that the prophet is bringing to the mindset of the people as they're thinking in their mental. This should be a thing that they should be able to answer. So, so in this, the Lord God speaks to the prophet and says, testify against me. All right. And basically what he's saying is based on these two questions. He says, okay, I've asked you the questions. Now, I want you to give me the answer. I want you to make your accusation. Or I want you to be accountable, meaning given an answer to these two questions that I presented to you. Now, that may be deep for some people. Because all of our shoulda, coulda, wouldas and our complaints that we bring up how is it that we bring up these complaints, but we can't account for our complaint unto the Lord? That's probably a tight one for someone that's listening. We make complaints. Uh, we mumble under our breath. But he says, hey, you answer. Uh, I, I want you to answer my two questions based on the lifestyle that you're living, based on the false worship that you're doing. These are my two questions that I'm always presenting to you when you get into that quagmire of a lifestyle. And I need you to be able to answer to me uh, uh, based on accountability, because, see, if you're going to give an account, that means you're giving an answer based on what you're doing. Not that watch this. Let me say it in, 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 in layman's term. He asks you questions for you to account for your actions, not give an excuse for your actions. Accountability is you giving an answer as to what was done, what wasn't done, why it was done or why it was not done. It's not for you to give an excuse, i.e. He, he doesn't need you to have an Adam moment. And I say an Adam moment because I remind you, even in the Garden of Eden, when the Lord came to Adam, he didn't give account for his sin. He gave an excuse. He said, it's that woman that you gave to me. So, so he begins to deflect his fault. He begins to redirect the attention from himself to blame something else. And see, the Lord God doesn't, doesn't deal with excuses. He deals with accountability. So this is what, what comes to our attention as we get here in, in verse 3. Now, let us look at verse 4. It says, the, the scripture says, and once again, the prophet is still speaking in first person. He says, for I brought thee up out of the land of Egypt and redeemed thee out of the house of servants and sent before thee Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Now, I like this verse because there's a lot of meat in this that probably many have not seen. All right. Uh, because something you should find very interesting here in Micah chapter one, up until Micah chapter six, the prophet is speaking in first person as to what's the issue at hand. But what's very profound is the Lord God uses the prophet to take them back to their beginning. And when I say back to their beginning, remember, we're talking about the children of Israel. So what we see here in verse four the Lord God uses the prophet to remind them their beginning or their start in the exodus from Egypt. This is their, this is, this is their, their, their first deliverance experience as a people. Okay. Now listen to what the verse says. He says, for I brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And I want you to understand even the bringing up of them is, is not like we do as a cliche 
uh, in our Western world culture, we will usually say, let's say, uh, as an example, uh, you you go to a northern state, amen. You you go to Michigan or 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 somewhere in the north. All right. And let's say you came from a southern state like Alabama or Florida or Georgia. We will say I came up from Alabama or I came up from Georgia and went up to Michigan. So we associate being brought up in this context as somebody coming from the direction of south to north. But what I want to give you as a revelation is the term that shoes there for brought thee up uh, is the Hebrew word Allah. Now, the Muslim faith uses the term Allah in association with what they worship as a deity for God. All right. But the term Allah in Hebrew means elevation. Or to ascend. And see ascension. As we're having a spiritual conversation of understanding the text. Ascension is about you going into a higher place spiritually. I.e. a higher place mentally. A higher place internally. So the Lord just didn't bring them out of Egypt. He ascended them, meaning their deliverance from Israel, or excuse me, from Egypt was more than bringing them from a physical place. It was bringing them to a higher level of consciousness in spiritual things with him which is why the journey was to stretch them in their relationship with him. So now the scripture says, I brought thee up or I ascended you out of the land or the territory of Egypt. And of course, Egypt is only our Western world name. Uh, it's really translated from the Hebrew word Mitzrayim. And if we, we begin to, to go back into the book of Genesis, we will understand there was actually a person named Mitzrayim, which was all out of Noah's descendant of bloodline. And Mitzrayim, uh, uh, or excuse me, out of Abraham's bloodline, Mitzrayim, as we know for the record, was the first Pharaoh of Egypt, first king of Egypt. All right. So in this uh, we see Mitzrayim, which means lower and upper, meaning two territorial regions. Uh, he says, I delivered you out of the territory and I redeemed thee out of the house of servants. Let me touch this section of the text for a minute. Hopefully give you more revelation. So in this, as he says, I ascended you out of a territory he turns around and says, and redeemed you out of the house or the dwelling place of servants. Now, as he redeemed them, it means to preserve them, sustain them. And in the preserving and sustaining of them, it comes out of the root being based upon being rescued or delivered. So in this, he said, I ascended you or I brought you to a place to bring you into higher, uh, higher, uh, a level of thinking and spirituality by also the process of a rescue and a sustainment. Now, some should be visualizing right now, as you're thinking back with the Exodus, this should be coming into fruition for you. It should be coming together piece by piece. But, but, but here, here's the thing. Also, don't disconnect yourself from this because you will see this is what goes on with us. 
All right. We are in a low place as individuals based upon the world. And so the Lord had a plan to carry us to a higher level of consciousness by us being redeemed or rescued uh, and being delivered by him speaking to us through us, i.e. the word says, how can they hear unless they have a preacher? How can they have a preacher unless they be sent? Amen. So notice I, I, I use that scripture even here. In correlation to this verse, because uh, let me continue to bring something out to you before I bring this thing to close. It says, I redeem thee out of the house or the dwelling place of servants. Now, for those who know a little bit of Hebrew, the word servant that's used here is the Hebrew word ebed. And when it deals with uh, men of God in the scripture, ebed, ebed, excuse me, is associated with the prophet because the term ebed means bondsmen or somebody bonded to something or someone, or they're in bondage to it. And, and, and being in bondage to something, let me also clarify what bondage is versus slavery. Because some of us may not have the complete understanding. Slavery is you being in chains and being forced uh, to do labor that is to no gain for you. Bondage, however, really in layman's terms means having a job. You're working uh, uh, to something or for something without your whole heart being sold to doing it, but you're doing it in order to sustain yourself or for a return. Think about it. In layman's terms, that's why many of us have jobs that we don't love. Some of us have career fields that we're passionate about, but others have career fields that you do to make ends meet. That's what bondage is about. Doing things that uh, you may not be fully sold to, but you're doing it anyhow. So now the Lord says, I delivered you from doing dead end jobs in your life that weren't carrying you anywhere and they weren't doing anything and you were not even sold to or committed to being passionate about what you were doing. So in this, he says, I delivered you and preserved you out of ungodly dead end jobs that have you in bondage. And then he says, there's a semicolon in the verse. He says, and I sent before thee Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. And what's very profound, as I looked at this portion of the verse, I was like, Lord, there must be something else that you're showing me here spiritually for us to understand. And it was very profound when I began to look and the Lord began to give me a little bit more revelation. He said, first of all, uh, even in this verse, I was doing an apostolic work that some people didn't even realize. All right. And some right now are saying, well, what do you, what do you, what do you mean an apostolic work? Well, watch this. All right. Notice that he says, I sent before thee. All right. Now, remember, as a prophet, a prophet is not only one that declares things on behalf of the Lord, but their declaration is words to prepare a people. So that means they got to have foresight that's ahead of people in order to tell people where they are to get them to the next course of events. But notice that it says sent and sent. If you look at it, New Testament wise, after the preaching of Jesus Christ, sent is the Greek word apostelos, which means apostle, which which means foundation layer, which means forerunner which means ambassador, which means one who looks for the diamond in the rough, i.e. I see coal, but I know what pressure needs to be put on to pull the diamond out of the mist. So so in this now, get a, get a revelation tying New Testament revelation to this Old Testament text. He says, I sent before thee, or I apostolized or commissioned three, Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Now, most of us saying what uh, we know that the Lord God sent Moses because of the writing of the Torah. 
because of the writing of the first five verses of the Old Testament. But by this verse, the prophet said what was really hidden in an apostolic move by the Lord God is Aaron and Miriam were sent as well. Now, we're looking and saying, well, wow, we knew the role of Moses and we knew that Aaron had a little bit of role, but how is it Miriam as well? And so the Lord had me begin to look again at uh, their names. And remember, names speak to characteristics. Names speak to reputation. Well, when you look at Moses' name, Massah, his name means a drawing out or a rescuer. Aaron's name, or Aran, means exalted, strong, or watch this, mountain of strength. Then Miriam's name means rebellious. So now think about it. Think, think about this right now as I bring this to a close for this evening. As I bring to your attention even these three individuals that the prophet names in the verse, you think about it, Moses drew them out of Egypt as part of the rescue plan. They went into the wilderness in order to get to Mount Sinai or Mount Horeb, which was the mountain of strength, because the commandments that Moses gave was to strengthen the people. And then they were in a place of rebellion in the wilderness in order to determine who was the remnant that would be sustained to go into the promised land. So now I say, ah, wow, what an aha moment. All three of them, not only by what they were being called or identified as, but the character of their name as a family. Remember, they were siblings. As a family in the Lord God, they were prophetically speaking the preparation path for the people that they as a family were commissioned or apostolized to deliver unto the Lord through the journey that we call the Exodus by the text. Isn't this profound this evening? Isn't this profound? So in that, I, I will conclude right there this evening to be obedient to time. But I, I pray that what I've given in these first four verses of Micah chapter 6 have been very profound unto you and gave you another level of not only understanding of the literal text, but a spiritual revelation of the text to even speak to you in the now. And with that being said, amen, 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 and may blessings be unto you.